This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. In particular, this month is being sponsored by Lindsay Marie Trebet, UFO Weekly News, Eric Irvin, and Nick Martin. I thank you all so very much. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. And welcome to this live edition of Where Did the Road Go? Um, been doing quite a few of these lately. So, uh, yeah, I have Peter Robbins in studio with me, who will be joining me momentarily. Uh, you can uh, hit us up with live questions if you're listening live on WVBR. And uh, you can do that via the website at, uh, six, at uh, wheredidtheroadgo.com or... You know, I have posts up on Facebook and the Facebook group and stuff. If you respond to one of those, I should see it, and we can address your questions. So, um, that is the best way to get a hold of us during this conversation. And uh, we're going to be talking about just uh, UFOs in general, I guess. We're going to go over the way the media treats it, the way uh, it's looked at uh, and ridiculed and uh, what you know, why that might be the case. So it's been a while since I've had Peter here. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long, but it's been at least a year or so. Right, Peter? Indeed. I should turn you up. There we go. <laughs> so, yes. Um, and how are you doing? Pretty good, all things considered. Oh, fair enough. Um, you've, been, uh, you've been quiet for a while. But you've been doing conferences and stuff, right? Uh, a few. Um, definitely a, a lighter schedule than I've had uh, in the past years. Uh, part of that was just shifting gears the last two years or so and going from the work that I do to being more and more uh, a full-time home caregiver as my dad's health gave out. Yeah. And as you know, uh, he certainly like you. Uh, he passed uh, last November. Uh, good long life, 98 years and seven months. Wow. And uh, years. very together until the last few days. So, yeah, time of change for me and uh, major shifting of gears. Um, I am now, as you know, a homeowner <laughs> and working away on a house uh, that needs work. Yeah, but, um, I know how that goes. I know you do. I know you do. It, it's been a year since we were flooded, uh, and I'm still recovering. And, 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 you know, real quick, I want to give a shout out to everyone from all the listeners from this show that helped me recover uh, from that initially, because yeah. you guys were all lifesavers. You really were. Um, and that was a year ago, and I still uh, have issues with the well, and there's like my shop is still destroyed, basically. <laughs> but uh, I'm working around the stuff that I couldn't fix right away. Good. But... Uh, yeah, it's it's listeners to this show. I mean, a lot of people help, but the listeners to this show help the most of anyone because you guys are awesome. And girls, obviously. Well, what you yeah. do comes back to you in this life. Um, I feel the same way. Um, everybody should have the problems that I'm having <laughs> uh, <laughs> compared to most of the folks in the world. And, um, yeah, a couple of um, exciting new projects under development or just completed with a great conference coming up in two weeks, and that will be the uh, annual Exeter, New Hampshire uh, UFO conference and festival, which I'm very proud of having helped to found about seven years ago and uh, very much looking forward to returning to beautiful New Hampshire at the end of the month. And uh, Nice. Yeah, exactly. Do you know who else is going to be there? Oh, yeah. Uh, Kathleen Martin will be returning. Um Kathy, of course, um, wrote several extraordinarily fine books with uh, the late, great Stanton Friedman, right. who we lost uh, some months back and uh, who many of us miss very much. Kathy and I will be doing a tribute to him. Um, we have um, Jim Weiner and Charlie Fultz, who uh, are two of the best presenters, quite honestly, I've ever seen work. 
They are two of the four men that composed the so-called Allagash abductions years ago. Uh, a brother, two brothers, two old friends camping out in Maine, um, wild as it sounds, who were abducted from moving canoes and whose case was uh, extensively researched and written up uh, in the Allagash incident by uh, Raymond Fowler, one of our finest and most respected UFO writers. Uh, the fact that Charlie and Jim are both professional artists, uh, not just extraordinarily wonderful guys, but their presentation is unlike any I've ever seen. It's, mm. to put it mildly, brilliantly illustrated. Uh, hyper-articulate, really a special, special one. And um, I'm going to ask your listeners to simply go online. Just type in um, 2019 Exeter UFO Festival. Uh, go to the speakers page and lay out all the folks that are going to be there. Some are more regional, not um, as big a names as um, Kathy uh but all worth seeing. And it's also one of the most uh, well-organized and modestly priced conferences. Really? It is $20 for the weekend. Oh, wow. That's exactly. great. Exactly. And that is two full days, plus a bunch of wonderful events for the kids. And for those of your listeners who are not New Englanders or who don't know that area much, um, it's extremely historic, drop-dead beautiful, and... Uh, like a Curry and Ives print come to life. The main square just makes you think you've traveled back in time. Uh, so always a chance to see old friends and um, working now on a hyper brand new presentation for February for the second annual UFO Megacon, which is kind of a reboot of the original International UFO Congress when it was a week long. Oh. and compose 30 or 40 speakers rather than it's a terrific conference and we'll be coming up um, second weekend in first weekend in September, weekend right after uh, Exeter um, in Phoenix. But like most conferences, it is a weekend with, you know, however many speakers they can pack in there. Right. But um, very excited to have an opportunity to do an entirely new piece of work as well. Nice. Nice. Um, so let's let's talk about a little bit of what's going on in the UFO field. It seems like, I mean, we've talked TTSA to death here. They have their new TV show and stuff. Um, I don't know that we ever got your opinion on this stuff. Um, to me, it seems like a lot of disinfo with maybe a real, you know, some, some legitimate pieces thrown in. And uh, what, what's your take on all of that? I, boy, it's such a double-edged sword. I have a, um, a real affection for really quality historical fiction, let me put it that way. Um, uh, a lot of people think, people like me, read nothing but UFO books. And certainly, I've gone through years where that's been pretty much true. Uh, but I hope I'm not disillusioning anyone. I actually like reading books on other subjects sometimes <laughs> and actually reading for pleasure occasionally. Uh, I was reminded of this particular book, and it's worth a brief digression, because I guess a year or so ago, it was a series, I think on Netflix, called The Alienist. And that term hmm. refers to, in the latter part of the 19th century, people who were considered insane or mentally ill. It was like they lived in an alien sensibility. Okay. And the earliest oh, term yeah. I know what you're talking about for now. psychiatrists saw, saw was alienist. Yeah, I didn't see the series. I saw the promos for it. Yeah. It was absolutely terrific. And it reminded me that when the book came out 25 years ago, I had made a mental note to read it. Um, Caleb Carr is a master of recreating the latter part of the 20th century in New York City. Like... Um, um, uh, the writer who wrote Ragtime. Um, I'll think of his name in a minute. But um, I just finished reading the book the other day and actually was thinking about the idea of bringing uh, a very real and historically important person like uh, Alan Hynek to the fore in a series 
because in this book, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who was police commissioner in New York in 1896 or so, is a character. Uh, very well researched, and the could-haves and would-haves, you can buy parts of it, but you can just enjoy it for what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, however, I guess I'm highly sensitized to the UFO subject. Sure. I like great fiction, and I like great reality. But when you mix them, it can be problematic. Yeah. It can unintentionally mislead or misinform the public. And if you're like you and I and fairly well schooled in some of the specifics and the players, you can sort it out and enjoy it for what it is. If you're a newbie, you have no idea yeah. where yeah. the truth and the fiction dovetail. And for me, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. now it's time to um, reprogram you and let you know what you just saw and what's real and what's not real, <laughs> which is kind of taking the fun out of it on a certain level. And, and really, the UFO field is so full of sketchy characters and, <laughs> and muddy evidence <laughs> and everything else that it, it, it's already halfway into yeah. the fiction realm on its own without any help. I mean, I, I can see the pitch sessions. Uh, I can see trying to, you know, sell the money guys the idea, um, pulling together the production uh, the excitement of working on it, and don't get me wrong, um, I, I didn't watch every part of every episode, but some of what I saw was engaging, enjoyable, and um, uh, made you think. But again, the potential for veering off the road. Um, now, w w which show are we talking about? Um, I'm blanking. The Project one Blue Book? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, one, I don't think which, we, st we we announced that's what we were talking about. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> well, I was talking about the group, the the uh, To the Stars Academy. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but let's let's continue on Project Blue Book because I wanted to talk about that too. That I, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, and I liked that at the end they told you this is what the actual case was. So they yeah. kind of separated the fact from fiction. Yeah, to a degree they did. You're right. Um, again, it was uh, for anybody that's not familiar with who J. Allen Hynek is. He is a mega legend in UFO studies. Um, for the latter part of his life, he was the elder spokesman, um, the front man, so to say. I actually heard Alan Hynek speak before a, a special committee of the General Assembly of the United Nations hmm. in the late 1970s, along with Stanton Friedman, along with Jacques Vallée, um, um, along with a... Um, uh, extraordinarily courageous uh, helicopter pilot, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Coyne, a uh, very mm -hmm. famous case of a helicopter being pulled up about 1,800 feet or so by an unidentified really? flying object. I don't think I know that one. Yeah. Um, but Heineck, again, it's a worthy digression, um, was head of astronomy studies at Northeastern Univers Northwestern University. There's dyslexia for you. Um, <laughs> and a very respected academic who was essentially on retainer with the CIA, and who was in the early 50s somebody that they called on to help formulate their disinformation policies. The turn in Hynek's life came, and I guess in a way his uh, moment of reckoning, in a way, when he was called on his bull by uh, the late great Dr. James E. McDonald, a brilliant atmospheric physicist um, at the University of Arizona who was kind of the Stanton Friedman of his time in that he was um, a tremendously respected, brilliant scientist, but um, he took on a task that was almost superhuman, which was trying to bring the seriousness of the UFO subject and the reality of it to the international scientific community and to the United States Congress and basically crashed and burned. Um, mm. His life was literally destroyed by uh, Philip Klass um, yeah. and um, he ended up taking his own life. But Heineck, um, by his passivity, by not taking a stand early on, um, McDonald called him on it and basically read him the riot act hmm. and, and uh, not long after ended his own life. And we can only imagine. Uh, and it was a, a true change. Heineck basically went public at that point and 
and announced his change of direction. And, and, and what was his issue with Hynek at the time? Um, that Hynek worked for the CIA. Oh, <laughs> right. And was it the CIA or was it the Air Force? Uh, well, um, the CIA, in terms of being a consultant, the famous Robertson Panel Report, mm -hmm. which any of your listeners can Google, go online. Um, it was a series of meetings over several days in February of 53, I think, if not 52, but I think 53, whereby a policy of disinformation and under kind of the heading and quotes of education mm -hmm. and debunking was consciously established by the CIA relative to the subject of UFOs. It is a fascinating dark little moment in American history. And um, the minutes of these meetings are available for you to read. Oh, wow. Um, and it's, it's very real-time stuff. They're talking about how they can, and some of it very prophetic, um, how can we get people to believe that everything is explainable in conventional terms? Right. Um, and one of the things that they did was think about people then who were serious players in the media to assist them in the process. Um, not that it's a name that would ring a bell for a lot of your listeners, but for their parents and some of their grandparents, uh, a, a very popular American broadcaster in the 1950s and I guess in the later 40s was a man named Arthur Godfrey. Um, he also happened to be a private pilot, so oh boy, <laughs> and figured that they would get him enrolled. The other thing is um, right now, I mean, you say the name Walt Disney, and there's probably eight people on the entire planet Earth who might not know who you're talking about. Right, right. In 52, 53... Disney was still on the cusp of its original incarnation, which was a cartoon studio. Mm -hmm. Their connection with the government was like a lot of contractors. They helped to make little film strips during World War II wow. that were used. This is how you load your, you know, take care of your M, your M1. Right, right. Um, but otherwise, it was Mickey Mouse and, you know, the stock characters. It was in 52, I think, that they basically bet the ranch um, on a live action film. And... Very few people know how close they came to total bankruptcy and self-annihilation. The film was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, mm -hmm. one of the great, timeless science fiction classics of American filmmaking, and it changed Disney's fate, and they moved on. But they're talking about maybe we can get the Walt Disney Studios to help us out here. And one of the ideas that they had, again prophetic, was how about a television show? where we present the case and then like air force guys go in and they investigate it and they show you what really happened you know right, when the right. the headlights refracted off of the clouds of the low pressure system <laughs> and this schnook believed that it was a a, a ship from mars um, those shows have come and gone um anyway off on a tangent but an important one um i Again, whether you want to call it faction or infotainment, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's dodgy, and you have to be really careful. Entertaining, definitely. Um, I guess, for me, I, I prefer things more cut and dried, either like Taken, the miniseries executive produced by Steven Spielberg from mm -hmm. some years mm -hmm. back, uh, or documentaries, you know, right on the money. Right, right. And, and you get a lot of based on real events or this is a true story and yeah. the amount of truth in it is like a drop yeah you know they've changed everything but the idea came from saying that really happened it's it's a caveat um that hollywood has played with you know since before we were born uh sometimes it's actually fairly close more often than not as you say all you have to do is say based on yeah and yeah. sky's the limit whatever we want to say is fine as long as Joe Blow has mentioned. And you also have movies like, uh, I think it was, was it The Fourth Kind uh, with Mila Jovovich, yeah. which came out as being real. Like, this is this is the woman where really, who, when she was really going undergoing this stuff, here's Mila playing her part, and all of it was fiction. But yeah. a lot of people believed it was real because they said it was real. Yeah. You know, was, and that that's, 
I don't know. That's disingenuous to me. It is, but when it works, it can work brilliantly. Sure, I remember sure. what Blair is it Witch. now? Blair Witch. I was is just going to say example. twenty years ago, <laughs> and that is not. I mean, I like a good scary movie, but that's not my usual milieu. That scared the hell out of me, and I don't mind saying it. That's a half a million dollar investment that came back gangbusters. The reason I mentioned Heineck in this light, though, was anybody that doesn't know Heineck, everybody's seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Right. right. Here's a guy who was so well known in the field that he played himself yeah, yeah. in the control room in that end series of scenes where Francois Truffaut, the great French director, is essentially playing a character based on Jacques Vallée. Yep. And Heineck looks like Heineck. You know, he looks like a scientist, <laughs> like Stanton Friedman did. Yeah. He's got his little beard, the glasses, smoked a pipe, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't know why they didn't have Vallée play Vallée. Maybe his English wasn't quite good enough. Or yeah. he wasn't interested, or, yeah. or, or, yeah, although it's hard to imagine anybody turning down uh, an opportunity like that. Like yeah. that. <laughs> and, I mean, obviously that's clear fiction. There's no, you know, they're not trying yeah. to muddy the waters there. When Blair Witch did it, it was more of a... Um, uh, uh, Cinema verite, handheld camera. Yeah, it was. It was. It was meant to, but it was a. Pro, it was a pr- promotion, basically. You know, like this is real. I mean, they came out eventually and said, "Okay, yeah, this wasn't real." You know, um, and then did sequels and stuff like that. But um, that first thing was the brilliant in the way they marketed it. It was, and uh, it really got a lot of attention for a movie that they really didn't spend much money on. No. I mean, considering that there were no real special effects, it was minimalist. I like that. Well, I agree. In fact, it's a reminder, um, especially for those of us that remember simpler entertainments growing up at a time where, when I was a boy, um, I could go to the fantasy theater in Rockville Center with some of my geeky little elementary school friends on our bicycles. And for an outrageously low amount of money, watch one or two black and white movies where monsters from space attack the Earth and (laughs) ultimately are defeated, hopefully. Um, But your imagination was so much more important. Um, I would encourage listeners who think, oh, no, that all, you know, that can't be worth listening to. Listen to the Orson Welles 1938 Uh, Americanized version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, the radio play. Mm. Um, At a much more simple time, that was incredibly frightening. And at a time when Americans were much less sophisticated, um, the fact that there were commercials (laughs) when the Martians are taking (laughs) over the Earth, people were so rattled that that's when they went to call their neighbors or if they were in New York rushed to the Hudson River to see New Jersey in flames Um, that kind of entertainment doesn't exist anymore because we um, almost we've developed almost a resistance we need more and more unfortunately uh, to uh, get us off so to say in the realm of entertainment but that stuff is real it's great fun to listen to to watch again I was thinking also um, I, I'm back and forth sometimes with my friend um, Robbie Graham in the UK mm-hmm. uh, who is a great person and one of our ranking scholars on the interfacing between classic science fiction and UFO reality yeah, about the silver screen saucers that's book. right yeah. Uh, It's a a great book and something everybody should have uh, in their library that cares about that confluence. Yeah. yeah. And um, for me, as a little boy, remembering going to the theater and seeing Invaders from Mars, Hmm. which may have been an $80,000 movie. I don't know. Right. It's early 50s. It was very frightening and very ahead of its time, too. It dealt with underground bases and implants and abduction Mm. Um, and it was also the original not the remake with Toby Hooper uh, that that he made um, I guess in the 90s Um, it's the only major science fiction film I can think of from the whole classic era where the viewer is experiencing things from the point of view of being a kid Mm. rather than a grown up Huh. And therein lies all the difference in the world for a kid. <laughs> wow, I hadn't thought about that. I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, um, it holds up nicely. <laughs> the TV show I was talking about was the one that the To the Stars Academy is doing on. Is it history? I've only caught bits and pieces of it. I haven't. I haven't even bothered because I I expect disinfo. 
You know, I expect, and I know Red Pill said he watched some of it. I think it's on a show we recorded the other night, and he said it's it's the same stuff that we already have seen, just put in a TV show. I, you know, I, I occasionally have to face off against that mantra on the X Files posters. I want to believe. We all want to believe or not <laughs> believe aspects of this work. We all long for certain things to be true or not true, mm -hmm. either because it's what we can tolerate, what we long for, what we're terrified of, what we dream may be the case. Uh, the whole um, academy thing, I, I wish it well. I hope it works out. I don't know why I have such a deep-seated kind of anxiety about it or basic distrust. I think it may already be being diddled with from oh, sure, above. Sure. And and so many of those people were already involved in other yeah. disinfo campaigns in the past. Yeah. So it's like why would you trust these people? Yeah. And again, I know uh you know like politics, we know a lot of people um that we otherwise like respect, love who hold completely antithetical political sure, views sure. to us. Uh we can either just agree to disagree, work our way around it, ignore it. But yeah, I I've got real problems with it and the idea that it's a business yes, uh, yes. as well you know it, it's not some glorious nonprofit. you know um you know we'll see what happens as the president is fond of saying and, and but there there are someone was telling me they're turning skinwalker ranch into sort of a park yes a, a for-profit sort of thing like come to skinwalker ranch i don't know if that's totally true but if it is i wouldn't be shocked wow well that opens up a whole nother level of what ifs you yeah, know well true uh true. you know dear mrs such and such uh, we are sorry to inform you <laughs> that your family while vacationing <laughs> were sucked um, into a portal we found their skin <laughs> yeah <laughs> should we keep it or send it to you <laughs> Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> the, what was the other thing I was just going to say? Um, Tom DeLong, I think, is genuine. I do. Um, I don't think he, I, his appearance on Joe Rogan was a disaster, but I do think he believes what he's saying. I do too. Um, and there in itself is a poignant story. Um, you are, can we even imagine a successful rock and roll personality? Um, I know. Blink-182 is a major group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If my life depended on it, that's me. I, I couldn't identify a single one of their songs, <laughs> but I know they had, you know, legions right, of fans. Right. And good for him taking a personal passion and interest, taking, you know, his bully pulpit based on his public life and saying, I want to enter into this and do something positive to bring attention to a subject that's important. Yeah. And then... The people that move the strings and the chess pieces saying, welcome. Yeah, exactly. Let exactly. us help you out, baby. And I'm sure some of what they're saying is completely true. Absolutely. But that's part of the problem. Yeah. To separate the threads. And that's often the problem. Um, and it seems like any high profile UFO case gets muddied over time because more people come out and say, oh, oh this is what I saw, even if they weren't involved. Yeah. And then you start not knowing who's telling the truth, who's, you know. Well, look at Rendlesham. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. A, that's a fantastic. Because Rendlesham was a good a good UFO case for a while. but even, Very important. Even in the beginning, you know, you had the fact that the, the government took those guys. And who knows what they did with them and messed with them. And, and so their memory isn't 100% reliable. For starters. You know, yeah, for starters. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's so hard to know. Like, like, do you think that the government actually knows anything? Yes, um, I do. Um, let's say that they began studying it, as many of us envision, or it's popular to envision in the summer of 47 rather than 41 or 46 or 36 or whenever. Um, surely they have accumulated a certain amount of knowledge over the decades, although I maintain one of the reasons that the cover-up continues is a certain kind of deeply institutionalized embarrassment at how little they've actually learned over the decades. And that in itself would have to be extraordinarily humiliating uh, for anybody to deal with. Um, 
I'm sure there's infighting been going on from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Uh, people that, you know, let's, we can't keep sitting on this. You know, it's just getting more and more ugly and more and more potentially embarrassing when the lid does blow on this. And others know we can't let it go. Let's remember that overwhelmingly the individuals who work within the offices and agencies uh, that oversee these matters. And it's not, certainly not anymore, an single MJ-12 type working group. It's groups within the military intelligence community and um, probably the international corporate world as well, et cetera, within the Catholic Church at the highest levels. It's endemic deep in human culture. And, and, uh, and that was the thing when the, when the New York Times article broke, the UFOs are being studied by the government. It's like, well, of course they are. Did you really think they're not, you know, no matter what they are, the government's interested in anything that's in our skies that they can't identify. That's right. That's right. And with good reason, of course, yeah. in conventional terms, at the same time, um, the initial cover-up, that piece of sand inside the pearl that gets the calcification on it to keep it from irritating the organism, that little piece of sand is the UFO story going back to 47. It's not our nuclear secrets. And in fact, uh, the whole origins of our national security state, which the United States of America most certainly is and has been for decades, uh, and brilliantly articulated in Richard Dolan's uh, UFOs in the National Security State, Part mm-hmm. 1 and Part mm-hmm. 2. Part 3 coming at us sometime in the future. Uh, the busiest man in rock and roll there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think some of the things that they know they may have no, still not worked out any way of going public with. Mm-hmm. For me, a good example is let's just say because no single world leader most likely can or would be able to just do it. Truman could have done it. Maybe Eisenhower could have done it. But now it would have to be coordinated among world leaders, among institutions of learning, uh, among religious leaders, science leaders, uh, uh, movers and shakers within the economic community, the petrochemical industry. But let's just say that they coordinated, and tomorrow night, Trump and every equivalent world leader goes on television and says, my fellow citizens, it's my solemn duty to let you know that as I speak, or close on this time, other world leaders are addressing their citizens and telling them, guess what? Anybody that thought we've been covering up about the phenomena of UFOs, used to be known as flying saucers, is absolutely correct. Uh, they're real. They're here. They may be queer. Get used to them. <laughs> the fact is, we're not alone in the universe. And um, we've been lying about that for years. And how many people would not believe it because they'd say, no, this is another part of the cover-up? <laughs> well, or the fact that that's now complicated by we, 10 years ago, taking a conspiratorial point of view on something was considered extreme. Mm-hmm. Now it's considered extreme not to. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, I the latest thing. Um, of course, um, Jeffrey Epstein hung himself in his cell all by himself with no help from any powerful person right. in the world who wanted to see him very dead. Um, the problem here is you can't dig half a hole. You can't just say, we're not alone in the universe. Um, now that we've told you that, we're going to start releasing bits of information so you can educate yourselves, and we would like to refer to you, you to uh, people who have done this work for years in the civilian realm, some wonderful names out there, can read their books and kind of get used to it. How do you just say we're not alone and then, oh, by the way, um, the fact is there's this part of the whole UFO thing called the abduction phenomena. You actually know somebody that it's happened to because statistically it's so extraordinary. Oh, did I mention that there's also this hybrid phenomena where there are beings that are part us and part them? Did we talk about missing pregnancies yet? Oh, no, I guess we didn't. Um, There certain pregnancies that 
you know, they ended abruptly and there was no explanation for them, those fetuses were taken. And they're on Alpha Centauri or on the dark <laughs> side of the moon or in an underground vault, uh, you know, three miles below New York City. And some of these um, um, hybrids, you know, they're so weird looking that who knows where the heck they're being kept, but you'd freak if you saw one. Other ones, well, they look so much like us that you see them every day. In fact, one may be living in your apartment building. I'm just waiting, you know, if that were to happen, how soon after that somebody who is anxious, who has a firearms permit, uh, and has a guy with wispy hair and pale blue eyes living across the hallway who's <laughs> yeah. into UFOs and geeky things like that, shoots him. Yeah. Because yeah. he could be one of them weird, uh, you know, yeah, alien our, types. Our xenophobia would definitely go through the roof. Uh, yes, literally could all be replicated. I think it's a tremendous series of challenges, and it cannot be reduced to disclosure. It's a uh, ongoing argument that I have with many people in that community, much as I adore and respect them. I think the important work that's being done in the disclosure community, people um, like Stephen Bassett, who are have actively put themselves on the line, devoted their lives to this, it hasn't resulted in world governments giving up all their secrets. What it has resulted in, though, is dozens and dozens and dozens of people influencing dozens and dozens of other people in dozens and dozens of countries to educate beyond themselves. And that can't be a bad thing. It is growing exponentially, but arithmetically, not geometrically. What would it take to make it break through? Uh, well, you know, yeah, there's food I, I for thought know. there. I, I have a number of, of suggestions, but... You know, and if you go back to the New York Times article, I mean, that came out, and the UFO community noticed, but the world at large was just kind of like, eh, you know? Well, but what followed was very interesting. In fact, a um, quick postscript on that was several months before that famous Times article, uh, which again talked about Harry Reid's interest in the subject mm -hmm, and the funding mm -hmm. of a, a study group to the tune of $22 million, um, and then the accompanying article, uh, uh, it started on front page later I in the Times, it was full page, um, continuing that first article and then something we're very familiar with, but to see it in the Times and reported seriously, yeah. respectfully, yeah. of two fighter pilots talking about being scrambled and seeing the objects. That was major. But several months beforehand, uh, one of our, uh, I think, real rising stars um, in, in the UFO community here in New York State, Cheryl Costa, a no-nonsense statistician who wrote a column for the big Syracuse paper that just folded uh, or just went from print to completely only online, one or the other. Um, there was an article about her work several months earlier, which didn't have the, the splash that Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal's right, article right. had. The most interesting thing for me about that, though, that's now almost two years ago, well, December of 17, the explosion of respectful coverage in print and broadcast, and it cuts across all lines. It doesn't matter whether it's Fox or CNBC. It doesn't matter whether it's Tucker Carson or Rachel um, or the Time magazine or a decidedly um, right-wing publication. UFOs and the phenomena all of a sudden is having this wave of serious, respectful coverage. Yeah. For a lot of us, people like me, who spent years researching uh, the roots of um, ridicule, um, I'm, I'm still waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. But that kind of change in the weather may be a real bellwether. That may be an indication of those people that pull the strings, wiggle the knobs, and uh, move the chess pieces around, that they realize that things are accelerating. Maybe they're aware of things behind the scenes that we're not that are pressing them to lighten up or back off or keep out of the way of people that are bringing more serious information to mm -hmm. the fore and dropping this completely pointless, 
insulting, condescending nonsense that has accompanied the subject since it first started to be covered in the summer of 1947. Yeah. Um, I think I, I feel like the, the phenomenon generally is very personal in the way it interacts with people, like people who have experienced it's a very personal thing, and I wonder how much the government really picks up of that. Like, they got the lights of the sky and who knows what else, but do they get the personal transformation yeah. element of it? I think they get it once it starts to um, make waves on the public scene. Um, working with Bud Hopkins for so many years, I was privileged to meet with, spend time with uh, people who allege that they had had abduction experiences, often backed up by a shocking amount of hard evidence. And when I say hard evidence, I mean the kind of evidence that you could present in a court of law. Different kinds of physical evidence, uh, multiple witness testimony, often within the family, mm -hmm. um, um, a obstetrician gynecologist, a um, psychiatric social worker, a therapist, um, a burn mark on the lawn, uh, neighbors remembering the electricity going out in the neighborhood, completely concurrent with the report of the incident, that kind of thing. Um, but when John Mack got involved in the work, for example, John being uh, a brilliant professor of psychiatry at Harvard uh, with a respected private practice, a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, a brilliant scholar and academic who, whose primary interest in the subject of other intelligences interfacing with human beings was where we could learn from these incidences ways to create um, less fear, more positivity, mm -hmm. um, um, to educate ourselves to what is good about these experiences rather than what is just terrifying, anxiety-provoking, yeah, yeah. frightening, spooky, um, etc. And I think when he became a major person that the media recognized, the government would have had to, whatever it wanted to do or didn't want to. I'm going to say the government, of course, it's a cover term for many offices and agencies and individuals. Sure, sure. Uh, Often at odds with each other, I'll bet. Um, but yes, that interest would follow. And now uh, one can only imagine that this whole new spate of um, television shows, um, network, um, cable, the world of YouTube television, which is now, as you know, I mean, it's massive. Yep. Not to mention... The world of broadcasting has changed so much since I started being a guest on shows, since you started being a host of shows. Mm -hmm. The whole podcast movement has blown up. There have to be offices and agencies keeping their eyes and ears on these up and coming interviewers, researchers, broadcasters, uh, many of them who are smart as whips, who are interfacing with each other who are um, doing something which I think is incredibly healthy, revitalizing the whole field. Uh, there was a time not that long ago when I wondered where the next generation was going to come from. And at a certain moment, somebody in their late 20s or early 30s who was showing serious interest in you know, getting a book out or starting to do interviews or um, you know, uh, interviewing people and putting their work online, it was a rarity. And now we're seeing more and more of them. And um, I think it's terrific. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the only thing with podcasts is now it's, it's like music. Um, it's great that everyone can easily put their music up online, get it distributed out there on but, their own, but now you're overwhelmed by yeah. it. And the same thing is happening with podcasts. It There's can desensitize so you. There's so many podcasts yeah. out there, and a lot of them are really good. Some of them are absolutely awful. But, yeah. like, you have to sort through it to find the ones that, that really stand out to you. You um, know, it's funny. Um, I'll have some months where I'll do an interview. Uh, other months where I'll do several interviews. I went through a period of time after my dad died where I just said, told everybody to, you know, wait six months or so to call yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Um, tonight is the first of four interviews I'm doing on radio shows and podcasts in a row. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> and then we go into later this month. Right. Um, and that's a bit anomalous for me, but it's a good indication. Uh, I'll accept most invitations at least once. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. if it's a host that has their head screwed on and uh, is willing to engage in serious conversation, and ironically, um, occasionally I run into a host or a producer uh, who, out of obvious respect for my work or me, will ask me softball kind of one-on-one -on -one questions, mm -hmm. which I do resent. Uh, <laughs> and I, it's, it's one of the few things that I insist on. If I'm going to be on your show, put me on a spot. You know, hit me with your best shot. Let's make this engaging. And uh, except for you, don't ask me any questions. Okay, That'll right. embarrass yes. me in the air. No problem. <laughs> I know all your secrets. I know you do. <laughs> um, so that this, uh, let's see if I can work my way around this question mm -hmm. to make it make sense. So you and I have a, a slightly different view of what the what might be beyond the phenom phenomena because you lean more toward the extraterrestrial. I don't. I think it's some other intelligence entirely, maybe even a, a higher level of ourselves. Um, but when you look at like Kenneth Ring's work and you see how he drew a, a very strong similarity between UFO abductees and people who had near-death experiences. And then you look at the stuff, uh, especially Ann Streber did, where she showed, you know, as she put it, this has something to do with death because so many people report seeing dead loved ones or people that they didn't know were dead, friends they didn't know were dead in these experiences, and even including Whitley's main experience where he didn't talk about the fact that he saw his friend in there because he thought, this is crazy, I'm not going to say this. And it turned out the guy was dead. Uh, what do you make of that? I think, um, well, when I first became involved uh, in the 1700s, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a fairly simplistic view of things like, like many of my colleagues um, in the latter part of the 70s, that, yeah, we're dealing with advanced beings from outer space. Um, I, I think that that is certainly still the case as well as everything you've just mentioned. For me, the one thing that I have learned over 40 odd years of obsession, work, involvement in what we'll laughingly call this field is the more I know, the more I'm aware of how little I really know when everything shakes down. Yeah. Uh, there's a wonderful definition ascribed to Zen beginners. Um, knowing that you know nothing and having it be okay. Yes. I know more than nothing about this subject. In fact, I know considerably more than a lot of people. But I also know that so much of it is empirically impossible to prove. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a, a lot of it, um, again, I'm lucky in that just, for example, working with Bud over the years, I was privy to several hundred individual cases and in some cases that meant witnessing uh, hypnotic regressions meeting members of the family doing intake interviews um etc cetera, etc cetera. i uh, the shakespeare phrase of is it shakespeare the universe is not only stranger than we imagine stranger than we can imagine mm. or there is more to your heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your mortal philosophy um, at a certain point, I realized, you know, as a little emoji of a human skull exploding, <laughs> that I am really clear at how open I am to these possibilities. I think that any of them are not out of the question. However, some of them defy odds and logic to such a degree for me or are backed up by so little. L like that, what? Um, the wilder claims relative to the so-called secret space program. Okay. Okay. Yes. You yeah. know, that we've mm -hmm. been on Mars the for hundred years. And, and all that stuff. Yeah. Exactly. I have a big problem with that. <laughs> Good job censoring yourself there. <laughs> yeah. And um, I have met people who I am convinced know as well as they can know that they have interfaced with beings who have informed them 
that they are from X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. One thing Bud always liked to point out that I think is true, and it doesn't have to do with good or bad, that when you are dealing on a deeper and deeper level with these other intelligences, deception is always a factor. Yes. One could say the same thing about us dealing with other us's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what we say is often very different than what we do. What our stated agenda is is often antithetical to what our real agenda is. Um, belief in itself can be our worst enemy. Mm -hmm. And if one finds a niche in the field um, that you're really comfortable with, that answers your questions, that supports your beliefs, that surrounds you by like, uh, with like-minded people, um, that gives you a sense of camaraderie and belonging, run out of the room as fast as you can. <laughs> That's I, good advice, actually. I, I think, sadly... Echo chambers are not helpful. So much of this is functionally identical to religion. I believe, and I know a lot of other people who do too, and um, we all have that same feeling about it. And there are a lot of us. And, you know, um, we really are growing because of it and learning. That's nice. But it doesn't mean it's... True. Yeah. Yeah. And if it serves you, that's fine. But please... As the great Judge Judy once said on the air, and I know because she said it on the air, I can say it, although it's not credited to her. I've heard it before. Don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. <laughs> um, yeah, and and you, yeah, belief is such a big part of this, but there is stuff, like if you talk to enough people and you look at enough reports, you know something is going on. Oh, yes. That, that part is completely undeniable oh, yes. yeah. if you're going to be intellectually honest about it. It is, and that's there, exciting. Yeah, there, there's something that people are experiencing. Sometimes it's just lights in the sky that can't be explained. Yeah. But other times it's personal encounters that literally change people yeah. because people don't change that easily. Right. And they may act like they've changed, but this, this was the thing with Dr. Ring's research. He found that the people who had abduction experiences and near-death experiences, it changed them. That's right. Which means it was a real experience because people who died and were brought back generally didn't change like yeah. that especially uh, with near-death experiences where sometimes their IQ would go up. Yeah. So if you're dead for five minutes and you're brought back, you're, you shouldn't be smarter when you come back. Yeah. You know, if, if anything, you're probably going to have brain damage. But yeah. these people came back and in some cases healed. You know, that's a great point, Soraya. Um, the fact is, um, in the early 70s when I was living in Manhattan and the city was close to bankruptcy, there was a catchphrase, you know, a kind of stupid thing, but we all get it. A, um, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. <laughs> There's a great novel by um, Chris Buckley, the son of the uh, uh, classic uh, conservative pundit when conservative really meant something, William F. Buckley. Mm -hmm. Chris Buckley is a humorist, and he's a novelist. And he wrote a novel, it's got to be at least 10 years ago, called Little Green Men. Hmm. The premise of the novel, and he did his homework, had a little too much fun at the expense of characters that were obviously based on Stanton Friedman and Bud Hopkins. But the premise is, you remember um, a, a political show, a Sunday morning show called Firing Line? Yeah. Okay. Um, the host of Firing Line, tough, no-nonsense, Jesuit-educated, smart as a whip, conservative uh, pundit John Irish last name and he'd have several liberals card carrying liberals and several card carrying conservatives it'd be um, uh, Buchanan and um, Eleanor Clift and he'd put out a premise and he'd say on a scale of one to ten, one being absolute, ten being absolute certitude, one being absolutely nothing, how do you rate this question? A very verbose way of talking. The novel has him as a central character. He's a mover and shaker in Washington. Um, he's a player. 
He's extremely well paid. He's a board certified celebrity. He knows everybody. Everybody wants to know him. Not that he's ever given a second thought to the idea of UFO abductions, but if he did, of course he knows they're not real. Because right. if something right. like that was real, he would know. One night he goes to bed, and guess what happens? Mm. Whole nine yards. Taken, probed, on the ship, returned. That's the beginning of the novel. Huh. And you see him trying to figure what the hell is going on here, driven like a madman, but knowing the moment anybody's on to him, his life as he knows it will be destroyed, not to mention his cushy salary, great position, right, et cetera. Right. He'll just be another nutball. Um, Whitley Strieber? <laughs> well, I, Whitley's in a class by himself on he, a certain level. He He's, is, but he had that very comfortable horror writing yes, career, and it that's literally right. yeah. went away when he published Communion. Well, I think you're one of the a handful of people that know that um, – I uh, was brought into that story fairly early on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Bud was working with him, and it was a top secret, really. Um, it's not a secret now, but Whitley was suicidal. Mm -hmm. Bud helped him. Whitley found Bud. Bud helped him find a therapist, uh, convinced him to write it out, to excise it because he was a writer. Um, helped him all the way along the line, and one afternoon— I get a call, cold call from Whitley Strieber, who essentially says, uh, and it's worth a digression, at least it is for me, it's something I'm proud of and just a fascinating moment in my life. He says, uh, let me just, in so many words, let me just cut to the chase. I know that Bud has been confiding all of my um, story to you and the mm -hmm. fact that I'm working with him and that you will have not spoken to anybody else, absolutely. And you know that I've been working on a book, yes, I finished the manuscript, and I asked Bud if there was somebody he could recommend who was familiar with this material, took it seriously, had experience in it, either as a researcher, investigator, or experiencer, and was a good editor. And I, he said, I could call you. Nice. I said, definitely. He said, would you read this manuscript for me? Wow, what? <laughs> Whitley Strieber. I had seen Wolfen. I thought it was a wonderful movie. Yeah, I had never yeah. read any of his stuff. But I knew he was famous, mm -hmm. and this did get me into a, 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 a jag of reading about half a dozen of his novels in a row, mm. and he was very good, Demi Stephen King. He got yeah, me. Yeah. Anyway, um, I said, sure, send it over. He said, no, no, no. There's one printed copy. And it's not leaving this house until it goes back to my agent. <laughs> Is this when he was living in New York? Yeah. Yeah. He had a wonderful kind of loft apartment in lower um, Greenwich Village mm. uh, on LaGuardia Place and said, can you set aside what will be a long day? Come in the morning. My wife and I uh, will feed you breakfast. You meet our son. We will put you in the guest room. We will bring you food. We will bring you soft drinks and water. And just you don't leave till you finish it. Yeah. And it was about 10 hours. I bet. And um, I went out, um, and we talked. And uh, I told him my advice. I, I told him I, I thought it was wonderfully written. It was going to be an important book. Um, he certainly probably had a sense that this was going to create havoc in his life. He said mm -hmm. he did. The only advice I gave him was as somebody who had been through my own therapy for years— I said, you are still in therapy. You are still literally working this through. I think you and your manuscript would benefit if you continued to refine it while you saw your therapist, but give it another couple of months. This is not time sensitive. You know, mm -hmm. you can. Yeah, yeah. He thanked me profusely. My best sense is it went to the printer the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. Bud also, I should say, found him the cover artist that did that iconic oh, cover. Yeah. And where that's important is the artist created an image. And many of your listeners, they know the image that I'm talking yeah. about. The book was probably translated into at least 20 languages, same cover in every language. He was working from a generalized description of your generic gray and his imagination. The fact is no one has ever to the best of my knowledge, reported seeing that creature because it doesn't exist. Right. Whitley 
if you ever get him on the show, you can ask him. He got thousands of letters, and Bud got hundreds. I know because I answered most of them mm. from people around the world. Say, dear Mr. Streber, I saw your book. I picked it up or whatever. Uh, I had blah blah blah. But no, the one I saw, it didn't have that kind of nose. The chin wasn't so pointy. Right, right. They literally corrected the image to be your classic gray, which in itself is kind of fascinating. Yes. Let's take a quick break. And uh, if anyone wants to throw us some questions, they can do so at wheredidtheroadgo.com. There's a little pop-up. And send us your questions for uh, my guest here, Peter Robbins, on Where Did the Road Go. And once again, I want to thank all of our patrons, but particularly those at the $10 or more level. Allison Cook, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Nick Martin, UFO Weekly News, Super Inframan, Eric Irvin, Tim, Edu Camahort, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Nate Syria, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, Paul Bichini, Kevin, John L- Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Lorg, Matthias Sunby, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Demian Tallman, Chris is a hot dog a sandwich, John Eddy, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You help make this show possible. All right. And uh, we are here with Peter Robbins. And uh, back again after an absence of a while. Um, let, me, let me ask you this. We we're talking about the, the classic gray image. What about all the other types of alien encounters people have? Because greys are not the only one. They became more common once Missing Time and, uh, and Communion came out. But what do you make of the large, immense variety of experiences people have? Yeah, I think we're dealing with several factors here. Over, um, for me, there is no solid statistical analysis that exists anywhere. The closest I can come is over the years I work with Bud, uh, in the X number of several hundred cases I was privy to, I'm going to say at least 75% of the descriptions of the other intelligences, the beings, were grays of one variance or another. The other 20, 25% varied wildly. Yeah. I think there are several reasons for that. Possibly because we do have wild variations of these beings. The other thing is, and this is as rock solid and scientific as I can get based on my long um, involvement in the field. They, and there's probably a myriad of theys out there, certainly some of them have the power or the technology to cloud our minds to create alternate images, to have us see what they prefer us to see rather than what may be right in front of us. Mm -hmm. Then Mm -hmm. there's another factor, and it's not mystical, it's not exotic. It has to do with the physiology of human shock. Mm. And it's something overall that the UFO research community ignores. I pay attention to it because I had the privilege and the challenge on and off for eight years of working as a very well-trained lay volunteer for the busiest suicide hotline in America. Mm. And um, we we weren't trained to be fake mental health professionals. We were trained to be good listeners, steer toward the pain, but have a basic knowledge of how we function in high stress and in uh, frightening, um, grief-oriented situations and the like. In a full-scale shock situation, um, and it can be a conventional car crash or getting a call that a loved one has suddenly and shockingly without warning died, uh, or being in a, um, a situation. I was once in a small sailboat uh, out um, in San Francisco Harbor that overturned. Mm. And to say I went into shock is an understatement. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't drown, obviously, nor did my companion, but it was very frightening. Um, 
the idea that if I um, am in my bedroom and am about to be involved in a classic uh, bedroom type abduction scenario mm-hmm. uh, with an odd light in the room, um, beings around the bed, or one particular being um, that I'm having attention on, um, and um, uh, Mike Clellan's wonderful work um, explores this to a degree, that If there is a gray alien at my window, I may look at that and my mind forget about its power to cloud my mind or whatever. My mind may say, oh, no, you're not. (laughs) Mm -mm. You are a four foot tall owl and you're white. Right. Yeah. I can live with that, but not with you. (laughs) And. That's, there's a kindness there in a funny way, but we cannot underestimate that factor. Um, yes, there are so many reports of reptilian types. Mm-hmm. Um, Giants, dwarves. Yep. My, my sister's um, best memories of her best remembered account, the one that she explored with the most depth with Hopkins, was, um, and we talked about it in the mid-'70s before the term gray existed. Mm -hmm. And she drew from her memory as a 12-year-old girl and used the phrase that she made up then, which was little doctors with big heads and big big black eyes that talked to me in my head. Um, There were a number of archetypical small ones and one big honking gray alien, (laughs) um, which was the one who was obviously in the leadership position, the one that she intuited was doing the the, uh, telepathic communication with her. Right. Uh, So we're dealing with a number of variables here, um, none which can be dismissed. And I I think certain people or groups or belief systems take liberties with certain belief-oriented people regarding some of them. Um, That's part of the nature of the work. You have con men and shysters and, you know, cult leaders on a certain level that are woven into the fabric of this subject. So when I look at this stuff, um, what strikes me is that not only do you have the grays in these ex- experiences, but you have them in ayahuasca trips. Yeah. And you have them in old cave paintings. And I know ancient astronaut people will be like, well, this was, you know, grays visiting us and they were recording them. But most cave paintings are altered state shamanic journeys, which suggests to me that whatever these things are, are part of a potential shamanic journey that we're still experiencing today, they're still interacting with this in the same way. We may put a different face on it, but I think it's the same thing. You know, you're just choosing that phrase, putting a different face on it, there's another variable, which is that under certain conditions of chemical alteration to mm-hmm. our physiology, it simply may be that X amount of Y results in the vision of Z a certain type of form mm-hmm. that emerges. Right. Um, I've, I've told the story in any number of, of situations and times on the air and uh, privately um, about my repressing the memory of my childhood UFO um, sighting with mm-hmm. my sister and how it took almost 15 years for the memory to came roaring back into my conscious mind uh, and for me then to confirm that memory with my sister and of course my life changed dramatically at that time. However, the fact is that um, I guess about, well, uh, it was October of 1966 when I took my very first LSD trip. Mm -hmm. And it was um, at a time, a much more innocent time, um, when that substance was still not illegal in the United States. So there was no sense of paranoia regarding it, like weed or, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. And it was the real deal. This was Sandoz, Swiss manufacturer, pharmaceutical company, in small glass ampules, It was a rip-roaring ride, (laughs) uh, a very positive experience overall. But there came a time 
during that 20 or so hours of altered state where the memory did come back. So much so that I did a series of, you know, obviously um, not highly disciplined, but watercolors Mm -hmm. of certain aspects of the memory. And then they just went into a portfolio that went into another portfolio that got parked somewhere for years. I pulled them out years later. And I was, again, before the memory returned and was so, I guess the combination was horrified, Mm. embarrassed, off balance, um, that I destroyed them. Really? I literally couldn't handle looking at them. And then once again, put it out of my mind. How do we do that kind of thing? I don't know. Yeah. It's the only case in my life where I've ever had that kind of experience. But that's how powerful it was. Again, perhaps some of those images that we find on a cave wall from 19,000 years uh, ago in Australia or 8,000 years ago in the Southwest or wherever, where there are synchronous kind of imagery. Mm-hmm. Um I, I think ancient astronauts goes over the top on a lot of this stuff. And, you know, dear Giorgio's aliens, <laughs> my first thought is not necessarily. Those could be sticks. That could be charcoal. You know, let's, Occam's razor, let's look at the more conventional right, possibilities right. first. Well, like I said, I mean, we, we know that a lot of the cave paintings are done by shamans. That's why that that connection I make there. Yeah. You know, and it's also possible that, you know, our brain may be encountering something it doesn't have a face for. Bingo. And so it's going, I I don't know, monster, you know, uh, alien. And now it has the gray as the cultural symbol of that. Yeah. So it throws a gray on it. Great observation. And we don't know the difference because our brain's only giving us like 1% of what's coming into it. (laughs) You know, it's like it's only giving us the things it thinks is important to our conscious mind. And some people just probably don't even see it at all. <laughs> probably. Now, lights in the sky are one of those things where, where weird lights people generally will see. Yeah. Because they're not so strange that they, they fall completely outside of their realm of experience. Yeah. So you'll see a light. You'll go, that shouldn't do that. But, you, you know, you can kind of deal with that a little bit better. Yeah. Even if you're a skeptic, um, at this point. In human history, with the degree to which UFO and alien imagery has embedded itself in world popular culture, everything from um, advertising of any possible subject in the world to the prevalence of uh, these themes in science fiction to references in literature to just pop culture in general, you know, you can allow yourself a little latitude on that. Oh, my gosh, I'm seeing... I can say it. An unidentified flying object. I'm not going to say it's, you know, um, beings from another world, but it's unidentified. It's flying, and it seems to be an object. Wow. Yeah. I've seen something. (laughs) Cool. I think. I hope. (laughs) Um, Yeah, the uh, and the one I saw over Cayuga Lake, I mean, it was gigantic. It had tons of lights on it. It was almost too bright to look at. And I'm looking at this. This is 2001, and I'm like, I don't know what this is. Like at no point did I ever Perfect say, year. yeah, at no point did I ever say it was an alien. You know, it was just like, I don't know what this is. It's not a plane. It's not a helicopter. Yeah. It's certainly not a toy. Yeah. Uh, now drones are more advanced, but I still don't think a drone could have been that big with that bright of lights. And I, I don't think we had quite that technology then, although who knows. You've just um, um, gone into a partial description of something that um, I remember experiencing when I had my UFO sighting, which was... Uh, overwhelmingly unambiguous, clear daylight, not a cloud in the sky, close enough to see windows kind of sighting. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I've interviewed several hundred individuals over the decades, both here and abroad, who have described that moment of I looked up and I saw this thing or things. (laughs) And I call it the checklist reaction. For me, it was (laughs) as a kid, not a plane, kite, blimp, balloon, helicopter, birds, strange-shaped cloud, flotsam and jetsam, reflections from the ground. What am I looking at? Right. What right. is that? And and with mine, too, like one of the first things I did is I was driving, and I rolled down the window, and I went, and it's not making noise. You know, because anything that big should right. be making a decent amount of noise you if it's something it, we man. have. Now, we don't know what kind of tech the, the government has. That's right. 
Uh, this whole Glimmer Man thing is slowly coming out, and it's not even just the government that's been developing these these Glimmer Man suits, but private corporations, you know, and it's slowly gripping out. But how long have they had this tech? You know, where they could walk invisible among yeah. people for the most part. You know, I for years I pointed as a model to um, Kelly Johnson, arguably the greatest military aircraft designer in history. He's responsible for the U-2, the SR-71, better known as the Blackbird. Mm -hmm. That plane, which um, if your listeners are not familiar with it, look it up, um, was off the drawing boards at the end of the Eisenhower administration. This thing, which looks like if sharks could fly, it's the most aerodynamically beautiful thing I've ever seen in the air, yeah, and I yeah. have seen it in flight once by a miraculous coincidence, uh, daylight sighting uh, near an air base in the UK. Um, it could climb at 10,000 feet a minute, it had two pilots. The only weapons on board was the um, uh, the pilot and the co-pilot's uh, sidearm, a forty-five caliber weapon. Um, they were equipped with Hasselblad cameras that could indeed photograph license plates in the Soviet Union at 80,000 feet. Wow. They could go, they could hit Mach 3. The skin of the craft was no thicker than a soda can. It was a flying gas tank titanium skin at full uh, operating, pull out the stops. It was literally on fire. It was porous. It just was like a giant flame. Mm -hmm. That's 1950s yeah. technology. And that's what we need to remember. Where we say we are, and I think at this point, mm, that came the out growth in, in the technology, 80s? Um, SR? Yeah. No. It was, um, the design was completed at the end of the Eisenhower right, administration. Right, but when did it come out to the public? Oh, um, yeah. Um, the late 80s. 80s. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I learned about it in the later 80s um, and saw it in 88. Yeah. Uh, but it was a very well-kept secret. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where you were going is the tech is advancing so quick now. That's it. Yeah. That where we say we are... Think about the little toys that they allow to filter down yeah. into civilian land. Right. You're sitting with two of them. Yep. An yep. iPad and, you know, an iType phone. No. We'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll say they're not I, they're LGs. <laughs> but, yes, you, you, your point is made. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, again, we are, we are so limited, even if we have a technological background, um, where we say we are, uh, there was a news item just a few days ago, a story I've been following on and off for probably 15 years at least, of um, laser technology that if aimed at a wide band at a crowd or narrow band at an individual can put, make you hear certain things in your head. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that that's been around to the best of my knowledge, for at least 15 years, they're using it maybe on, several decades. They're using it on advertising bull bull billboards. That and, tells you how common yeah. this technology really is. I, I think for law enforcement and for crowd control, it's probably used as well. Indoctrination um, to try to affect people's behavior, mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. for the best. Yeah. If you can convince somebody that they are, well, convince them. If you are hearing voices in your head, it can be God talking to you yeah. or you convincing yourself that you're going mad. Yep. Um, the it's it's very dark possibilities. Yeah, uh, the tech out there is literally frightening. And like I said, the Glimmer Man stuff is another example. It's basically an invisibility suit. And what we know of now is still probably far behind what they actually have. That's it. So no it's, matter how much we think we're keeping yeah. up on things, and we do have a lot of very tech savvy friends. And it's not always you know look at the the. The, the the UFO thing that came out in the New York Times, that was a small project. It was a small subdivision of a government project. You have corporate entities doing this stuff. You have government projects. And they're, they're not necessarily connected to everyone else. I think the difference there, and I say that as somebody who, I hate that term expert, but this is an area that I am an authority in. Right. I am, for example, the only person possibly on the entire planet who is nutty enough to have downloaded and read every single article, editorial, photo caption, letter to the editor, commentary, 
uh, relative to the subject of UFOs that the New York Times has ever published <laughs> since 1947. <laughs> it's more than 220 pieces. I I've th- read I them think all that, repeatedly. I think that was the last show we did with you. <laughs> Indeed. And the fact that, let's say, 97% of it has been sarcastic, condescending, dismissive, insulting to any intelligent person, um, that it changed dramatically with that article in Mm -hmm. December of 2017. That fact, possibly as much as the content, that the Times took it seriously, and it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the the right. Yeah. You can criticize or embrace a publication like the Times and what it seems to embody, um, no problem. But to acknowledge that they treated the subject completely differently, yeah. Yeah. something's up, and that that's the pattern that's followed since. True, true. And there are still all people major publications and broadcasts. But there are broadcasts still ridiculing it. Much less. Much less, yes, yeah. And we seem to have turned something of a corner, but again, we'll see. Yeah, that is true. All right. Tell people where you're going to be coming up. Yeah. Uh, next appearance is at the uh, Exeter, New Hampshire, UFO Festival and Conference in beautiful Exeter, New Hampshire. Uh, on August 31st and September 1st, uh, go to that um, online. You'll get all the information. It's $20 for the entire weekend. Great speaker lineup. Chance to meet all of us and spend some time in a beautiful historic community uh, on what's going to be a beautiful weekend, I'm sure. Okay. Is that the only thing you have coming? Um, Yes and no. (laughs) Um, I will not be at um, this year's International UFO Congress Mm. coming up, um, I guess it's the second weekend, um, the weekend after Exeter in Phoenix, Arizona, but... I am saying here on uh, broadcast for the first time that a film project that I have been working on for some months with two um, wonderful colleagues, uh, my executive uh, producer Jennifer Stein and our cameraman and uh, mixing guy, uh, an extraordinary tech guy, uh, Bob Terrio. It is a feature length, um, heavily illustrated, dramatic reading in the form of a film on the uh, life and uh, circumstances surrounding the murder of our first Secretary of Defense. I'm very proud to say that it has been um, made its way through the initial judging in the uh, International UFO Congress Film Festival Mm. and will be shown as one of the finalists. Um, I I, I can just say I'm really proud of the 30-odd years' work that is behind it. Nice. in terms of my obsession and fascination with this man and the opportunity to finally present it in a manner that will be of equal interest to audiences that could care less about UFOs to ones that do. Right. I really look forward to seeing that. You will. You also have a website that we haven't really updated much, but it no, is PeterRobbinsNY.com. Yes, and at some time... Hopefully, sooner than later, we will be doing some major updating. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me again, Peter. Glad to, my friend. It's been too long. We'll we'll uh, make it shorter next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.